I am thankful once again to be here. And it is amazing, as Brother Jimmy was saying, because we, we crossed paths several times, even when they were in New Jersey. Uh, I was looking at maybe starting a church in Philadelphia that we were talking about, and then we both took completely different paths and and wound up, he wound up in Florida, I wound up in South Carolina, and then here. So amazing how the Lord works everything out, but uh, very thankful. I, I really appreciate that last message, that wisdom in that. It's amazing. When I hear a message like that, I think, how deep is the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> you can preach a message on the beams, the nails. I mean, yeah. Yeah. and I don't know about you, when I hear something like that, I'm thinking of other stuff, too, that I never thought about until he started it. And I'm like, man, you, you can say this and that. Just so much depth, you could go on forever with that. It's yeah. a blessing. I got two things of feedback last night, my messages. My message, the kids said, Dad, everybody was way funnier than you are. You're too serious. <laughs> You're too serious. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, honestly, that is my struggle, if it is a struggle. If I, I'm terrible at being funny and telling jokes. If I tell a joke, most times they land. Like, I, I have to think about them, and they just land flat every time. <laughs> it's horrible. I have right. people in the church telling me, <laughs> people in the church telling me, Pastor, you shouldn't even try. <laughs> just don't even try. So, and the second was that these lights make my hair look even grayer. That's my wife. <laughs> my wife told me, and so she lined me up with a gray suit tonight <laughs> to make it pop even more. <laughs> Uh, that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you get. <laughs> Ephesians 6. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read several verses in the start of this message. Ephesians chapter 6. Very uh, common verses about the armor of God. I'll start in verse 10, read down to verse 17. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers, darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. <laughs> Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Let's go ahead and pray one more time. Lord, we sure have enjoyed service already. I know that I truly have been blessed by the congregational singing, by the special that was just sung. Uh, Lord, I just thank you for being part of this service. I pray now, Lord, that you would help my thoughts to be clear. I pray that you would deliver something to everyone here that would be a blessing to them, that would help them to trust you more, to grow in their walk with God, and will give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we've been talking about trusting God this week, and we look at these verses, and we see that we're in a war, and as we looked at in the beginning of last night, we're in perilous times. Yes. Uh, the Bible says in this past that we need to have this armor on because it's an evil day. Right. I think we all could agree that it's an evil day. And we need to be covered with the armor of God so that we're not afraid, but we can fully trust in the provision of God. When we're properly equipped, we can trust God the way that we need to trust him. And the Lord has provided all things that we need to trust him. He provides the armor for us in this passage. He gives us our covering. He tells us what to do. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, according as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God's given us everything for this spiritual walk. And it is an amazing list. I mean, you've probably heard series of messages on these verses, the armor of God, each one being so significant, each one needed. Why? Because we're wrestling not just against the things that we can see, but we're wrestling against the things that are unseen. There's spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a lot going on around us. And so we need to have the armor of God on. Isn't it amazing that so many times we, we wrestle in the arm of our flesh, right? 
we wrestle in all that we can do and everything that we can muster up together to fight all the problems around us. And we don't take on the armor of God. We don't use the word of God. We don't stand in the day that we should stand because we've not obeyed him. But I didn't read all the way that I wanted to read because I want to get to verse 18 today because I think it's an amazing verse to follow up because here's the thing. As you read this verse, it would seem, as you read those verses we just read, it would seem that there's nothing left needed to complete the equipment. It's all there. Yet verse 18 follows up with praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Uh, the Christian armor is the, the Christian soldier's arm head to foot. His loins girt about with truth, the black breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. What more is needed? What more is needed? The one essential now is the spirit encouraged to fight and be able to use the spiritual weapons skillfully and with effect. But the power to do that is secured by prayer. The power to use all that armor is secured by prayer. You know, Paul said in Philippians 3, verse 3, he said, we have, we have no confidence in the flesh. You know, as children grow older, your children and mine, they, they grow more independent as you're trying to teach them. They're, they're growing into their own. They grow more independent of dad and mom think they know better. Now, I've met a lot of Christians in life. that the, the, the more spiritual they think they've become, the more independent they've become of God. They've grown away from that trust. They've grown away from that faithfulness in God. And they're relying more on the arm of their flesh, which is going to fail them. They have confidence in the flesh. We can't trust our resources. We can't trust our own Bible knowledge. We can't trust ourselves as we seen last night. You can't trust any of that. You have to trust the word of God and you have to commit all of that to God in prayer. Commit all of it to him. Prayer is the energy that enables the Christian soldier to wear the armor and to wield the sword. Prayer. Prayer is the energy. And no matter how prepared you may think you are, you cannot fight the battle in your own strength. I mean, don't you think again, coming at the end of these verses, that you feel pretty good having put on all the armor going to battle. And yet if you forget prayer, you'll fail and you'll fall. You'll think, what did I forget? You forgot the most important thing. You forgot to rely upon God. You forgot to put your dependency upon him. Our efforts have to be supported by prayer. All all we have done has to be committed to the Lord. All has to be committed to him. The six pieces which comprise the whole armor of God can only operate with the utmost proficiency when prayer is the center of that effort. The Bible tells in Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is prepared against the day of battle. That reminds you at the end of that verse, but safety is of the Lord. You can do all the preparation, and you should. You should. It's not to do away with that. You should do all the preparation you can, but you better be reminded that you're going to lose that battle unless the Lord's in it, unless the Lord follows you there. Give all the preparation you should, but make sure you're praying. Paul's not saying in addition to these things, add prayer. I don't believe that's what's being said. I think what's expressed is that woven into all of these things is prayer. It's throughout all of it. Prayer. And that's why in verse 18, it, what does it start with? Praying always. Praying always. Well, as we consider this regard to the spiritual battle of prayer, we need to be praying consistently. Always. As we said, we can easily rely on our flesh. And many times we think, how could we do that? Yet some of the greatest, if we call them prayer warriors in the Bible, and we might look at some of them this week, a lot of the answers to prayer that God gave them were followed up by some of the greatest defeat you'll read about. Right. Isn't that an amazing thing to come around? You think, how could Elijah just have killed all these prophets of Baal, seen the hand of God, and then be running from Jezebel? I don't know about you. It makes me scratch my head. <laughs> but then I know me. <laughs> and I've seen God answer a prayer. And I turned around and I failed. Because I was relying on myself. Galatians asked us a great question. Chapter 3, verse 3. says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh great question to ask ourselves 
Many times we rely on that flesh. You didn't, you, you weren't saved because relying on your flesh. You were saved by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. What's going to sustain you in this battle? It, it's going to be faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, walking in the spirit. Now, prayer is about as basic as can be to the Christian life, it's, but it's not necessarily a simple subject, is it? Prayer can be very confusing. As I think of prayer, something that always amazes me and something I always like to bring out when I talk about prayer and we got a whole row of children. It just amazes me about God because we talked about who he was last night. What amazes me is about all these children on the front pews that God, God doesn't hear my prayer in a special way that he wouldn't hear theirs. Right. Amazing. This isn't a separation. I'm not preaching to the older people today. I'm preaching to everybody because prayer, you can go to the throne room of God at any age if you're sincere and you can talk to God. God wants to hear from you. But all this confusion with prayer, sometimes children are afraid to pray. Adults are afraid to pray. I, I've been in church, been pastoring, and, and I called somebody one time to pray. I said, brother, could you open us in prayer? And as I called him, I thought he had prayed before. But when I called him and I looked at him, he looked up at me and said, he shook his head no. And I thought, oh, man, I didn't mean to you know, embarrass him. I feel bad. So I prayed. And later on, I said, brother, I'm so sorry. He said, no, I felt bad, but I just I don't feel comfortable with that. But you know why he wasn't comfortable with that is because he had heard so many flowery prayers from the church that he had been before. He heard all these great prayers, and he thought, I never could pray like but God didn't want you to pray like that. God just wants you to pray sincerely. And one of the greatest, the greatest prayers I ever heard personally in my service was that man because I knew what it meant. To we had a Wednesday night prayer meeting, and if so anybody wants to pray, can pray. I don't want to compel them. We got down in prayer, and that man prayed, and I thought that was a prayer that God heard because it took a lot for that man to open his voice. Now, it wouldn't have been the best prayer. I mean, you wouldn't have been impressed with it, but I think God was. <laughs> I think God enjoyed it. Now, prayer can be complicated and complex. It's confusing many times. There's hundreds of verses that talk about the subject of prayer. There's many books written on the subject of prayer. And if people aren't careful, just like any subject matter, they take these books to mean if I follow these five steps that God will answer my prayer. If I follow this book or if I follow Ian e. Bounds or if I follow George Mueller, if I do it exactly like they did it, then surely God's going to answer it my way. But there's no recipe that God's going to answer your prayer every time. It's not found in the words. The verses regarding the subject aren't, aren't hard to understand. They're not. It's just when you put them all together, they seem to say a number of things, they indicate a number of things. If you just say, name it and claim it, you can get that from the Bible if you twist it. Right. If you just take them out of context, but there's numerous verses in the subject and you can imagine the different thoughts and different teaching. Psalm, I'll read some to you. Psalm 34, six, this poor man cried. The Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his trouble. Amen. Jeremiah 33, three, we, we pulled it last night, call to me and I will answer thee and show thee great mighty things thou knowest not. First Chronicles 4.10, Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed and enlarge my coast. Thy hand might be with me, that thou wouldest keep me from evil, but it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Matthew 21, 22. All things what should he ask in prayer, believing he shall receive. James 4, 6. You have not, because you ask not. Is all that not true? Yes, sir. <laughs> Hope you'd say so. Word of God's pure. It's true. But here's the thing with prayer. Every prayer has its particular place, time, setting, and audience. Prayer has context. Just like the word of God has context, prayers have context. This isn't uh, that we would name it and claim it, not if we have enough faith. Some people say, if you have enough faith, you trust the Lord enough, he'd answer every prayer. You don't find that in the word of God. You don't find that in the word of God. You, you find that God answers those prayers, and well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but he'll answer those prayers that are according to his will, not according to mine. I, everybody in here, I, I'm pretty sure could raise their hand and say, there's a lot of times my will and God's will weren't anywhere near each other. I mean, I thought I thought we were close, but God said, no, I'm not interested in what you think. I have my own plan. God doesn't answer the way that we think so many times. Now, we may be able to get some practical application from verses, but you have to be careful that you don't hold God something he didn't address specifically to you. The problem we have today is a false misrepresentation of God, the way he seemingly replies or does not reply in prayer. So much of modern-day Christianity treats God as some kind of genie. Yeah. 
They can summon him at any time. And he's only there. He's only there to make your life better. <laughs> I mean, that's true, right? He's only there to make my life better. That's why all my prayers are about me. Yeah. Why, why is God not answering my wishes? I mean, I hadn't read my Bible. I haven't studied. I haven't done anything for him lately, but I've been rubbing. I've been rubbing the lamp. Mm. I've, been, I've been taking my prayers up, and I'm not getting anything. But God, God's, not, God's not your servant in prayer. Now, some go on to accuse God of not being a keeper of his word, as if God owes them something. How many people I've witnessed to or talked to, and they said, you know, I used to be a Christian. But, you know, I prayed, and God let my mother die. You ever heard that? You ever heard something similar to that? You know, I, I, I would go to church, but I used to pray, and God would answer my prayers. And if there's really God, why didn't he answer that prayer? Wouldn't God want to answer that prayer? And you know what the truth is? I don't know. I mean, he didn't answer that prayer, so it seems like he didn't, he didn't want to answer that prayer. But who, who can tell the mind of God? Who's going to answer that? that? There's no, I don't care how long you fasted, you're never going to find the answer for that. You're never going to be able to reassure the heart of that person. Besides pointing to scripture and saying, I know that God does answer prayers. He just doesn't answer all the ones I want him to. And when I want him to. Now, it's interesting. It's interesting how we're so quick to find a verse regarding the way we think God should respond in our favor, isn't it? We can always find the verse that God should respond in our favor, but we're completely ignorant of all the verses that show how he should judge us. <laughs> you know, we find all these great verses. I mean, look, God should answer my prayer. Well, look at all these verses that God says he's going to judge you for your sin. Well, I don't look at those verses. I just want to look at the ones that make me feel good. I just want to look at the verses that that make me have my prayers answered. Modern day Christianity brings out all the supposed verses to which they say we can name it and claim it. And God promised. God said he would do this. How many are pointing to God what he promised when they follow after their own lust, follow after other gods? Not looking at it. You hear many people bring up how God kept Daniel from being a lion's meat in Daniel chapter six. Isn't that a great, great God yeah. to do that, to keep him? Uh, Daniel chapter 6, but you don't hear many bringing up Daniel's prayer in chapter 9. Why don't you look at it? Yeah. Look at Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. I set my face in the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with fast and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God, made my confession, and said, O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant, mercy to them that love him, them that keep his commandments. We have sinned, have committed iniquity, have done wickedly, and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, to all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces. Is that this day to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all Israel that are near, that are far off through all the countries, whither thou hast driven them? Because of their trespass, they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belong the confusion of faces, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways, which he set before us by his servant, the prophets. He goes on all the way to verse 19. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, hearken and do defer not for thine own sake. Oh, my God, for thy city, thy people are called by thy name. Look at that prayer of Daniel. No naming it and claiming it. It's just, Lord, how could you again listen to my prayers with all this sin? How could you listen to our prayers with the sins of our nation? I mean, look at how far we've gone, Lord. But I'm still asking because you're good. Still asking because you're a great God. Please, for thine own sake, would you please forgive? Forgive us for our sin. The Lord said, chasing those he loved. How many ever feel unloved because they're not being chased? <laughs> it's the opposite, right? Because my prayers aren't getting answered. But nobody says, you know, the Lord had not really chasing me lately. I haven't felt the love. <laughs> The Bible tells us that no, that the children don't, don't appreciate that in Hebrews, right? No, that's not pleasurable for anybody. Yeah, the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. 
and chasing it. The problem is we have false expectations of God. And even many people who are sincere in heart today end up being greatly disappointed in God because their misunderstanding of the many verses on prayer. So I want to go over some facts that we should be grounded in our mind when it comes when it comes to prayer. I believe much of the lack of trust that we have with God in prayer is because we don't even understand how to pray. We don't understand what prayer is to be. We don't we don't pray according to the word of God. God is is not man's debtor today. I hope we all agree with that. I hope that's simple tonight. God is not our debtor yet. I know many times growing up and in my, my selfish prayers, I would have never said that, but I probably thought that. I know there's been times even as an adult where I felt low and, and I was going through a trial of life and I thought, man, I've served God all these years. You ever thought that? I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I'm being honest. I've been there. I said, Lord, man, I've served you all these years. This just doesn't seem right. Why wouldn't you want to answer this prayer? But the truth is, God doesn't owe me anything. God's not in debt to me. He doesn't owe us anything. On our best day, on our best week, God doesn't owe us anything. If you're saved, he's already given more than you could ever rightly deserve. Now, I've heard it said so many times. I don't know how many people actually believe it. I've heard it said so many times growing up at church, you know, if I woke up and, and hell with my back broke, I'd get what I deserve. Yet there's so many people saved the day that think they deserve more. <laughs> They're saved, going to heaven, Holy Spirit of God inside of them, and they say, why didn't God answer my prayers? <laughs> good. Psalm 40, verse 5 says, Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. And thy thoughts which are to us word, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, there are more that can be numbered. It says the wonderful works the Lord has done. I mean, if we would just be honest up to this point, up to this point, if we listed every good work that God ever did, every prayer that God did ever answer for us, we'd probably say, man, I don't deserve to ever have another one answer. I mean, that God would already have done all that great stuff. And listen, I, I want to be as honest as I can. I know. But I, next time I need one, I'm going to be struggling. But I also know what I just read. Yeah. And it's true. I don't deserve it. Psalm 116, 12 says, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I mean, what, 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 what can I even give back to God to, to date to equal the benefits that God's given to me? To give back to God that answered the prayers that he's answered in my life. I couldn't repay enough right now. Let alone what is to come. We have no right to think we can force God to do anything. That if we pray a certain way or if, or if we claim, you know, people say you need to make demands of God. I don't, I don't know where you find that in the Bible. I mean, I find Job, you know, Job gets a little self-righteous in the book of Job going through all that. And then I find God coming to Job and said, Job, gird up your loins like a man. I'm going to make some demands of you. Yeah. I don't find man making demands of God. Psalm 39, 5, barely every man at his best state. Altogether, vanity. Altogether. There's no reference in the New Testament, where God wants believers to be rich or comfortable or in perfect health, as you hear so many wealth, health, prosperity preachers say today, you won't find that. In, in the Old Testament, they take promises given to a nation of Israel, earthly promises to an earthly nation, and they try to apply them to a spiritual church. You won't find the promises of God in the New Testament have to do with your physical well-being. It's spiritual. I, I honestly find it very amazing and, and somewhat comical if it wasn't so sad that so many of these churches can preach that when Paul's writing most of the New Testament epistles in prison. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, it's amazing. God wants you to be in the greatest hell. And I've, I've suffered shipwreck. I've been stoned and left for dead. This is my life. Health, wealth, and prosperity. You should give more to your pastor and he should be the richest person in the world according to their philosophies of their day, right? And Paul says, I don't even want to be chargeable. Don't give me anything. 
Well, where do we get this today? Yeah. It's a misrepresentation of the word of God. If we're not careful, even in conservative churches, we, we catch some of that. We catch some of that. Why am I having bad health? Why would I deserve bad health? Church prayed for me. Why hasn't my health been cured? Good, Jesus. Yeah. Did I not have enough faith? Did I not trust enough? Does the church not have enough faith? Maybe God wants to draw you to him and he's not going to answer that prayer and he's going to increase your faith through your bad health. Right. Mm-hmm. Paul said he sought the Lord yeah. three yeah. times. Yeah. I always find that amazing thing too. All the prayers you see that Paul gives, they're all for others except one that I can see and that's the one he asked the Lord to remove that thorn. He said, I asked him three times. You know what the Lord said to him? No. The one prayer we read that Paul prays for himself and God says, I'm not going to answer it. You don't think Paul had enough faith? <laughs> he was persistent. I mean, he went three times and the Lord said, you can keep coming as much as you want. I'm not going to do it, Paul. And he said, he said, that, he said Lord, I'll, I'll glory in that. Most, most gladly then will I glory in my, my suffering. I'll accept it. Can we accept the answer no in prayer today? Can we accept when the Lord says, I've heard you several times, but I'm not going to do that. It's not, it's not what I want for your life. So many prayers going answered because of lack of cooperation from us with God. Now we should be praying, the Bible says, always. We're never at liberty to put God in a box and say, you said right here. Right. Never at liberty to pull that verse out and say, God, right here, you said this. You need to answer this. You have to do it. But really, we should come before the God in humility, and before our God in humility. Right. What I don't deserve. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about pretense. I'm not talking about being fake. I mean, being honest, Lord, I don't deserve the least of all my benefits. I don't deserve any prayers to be answered. Right. That I can again come before the throne of God at all is, is a miracle. Amen. I am asking you, Lord, this be according to your will. I sure would like to see you answer this prayer. Reminds us of the parable that Jesus gave regarding the landowner's treatment of his labors. Matthew 20, verse 15, he says, Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is that, is that I evil because I am good? <laughs> Who are we again? As God... He, he can do whatever he wants. You're not going to put God in a box. You're not going to make God. You're not going to twist his arm. You're not going to say, you're not going to follow the five steps and get God to do what you want him to do. Right, right. Is it not lawful for the creator to do what he will with his own? Yes. Certainly it is. And we must never forget that. We have no right to force God to do anything. You know, so often something we forget is there normally some condition associated with prayers that are answered and with the promises of God in the Word. You know, so many people have grabbed the promises out of the Bible and they never looked at the context of the passage. So many people have grabbed the answers to prayer and they've never looked at the context of that passage. Right. In, in 2 Chronicles 7 14, many people probably quoted this in the past year with all the elections, but if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their name. You know, it's a great verse. It's a wonderful verse. But there's a lot of stipulations in that verse. You don't you don't pick up with I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. That's not where the verse starts. The verse starts with my people which are called my name shall humble themselves and seek my fa- and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I can't help but ask the question, but how many how much of prayer goes unanswered because of sin? Right. I, mean, I don't know again about you, but I don't know how many people I've met either witnessing or talking with, and they say, God, I'm answer my prayer, and they're living in sin. They have no intention of getting right about that sin. They say, I've been praying. What about that sin? Do you not think that, that sin is separating you from God? Yeah. Do, do you not do you not keep do you not try to keep a short account with sin? Try to teach my children, try to be reminded of myself, I need to keep a short account of sin so that when I go to the Savior, it should be all the time, that there's nothing between, as the song would say, my soul and the Savior. Yeah. I don't want anything in the way, and sin definitely gets in the way. 
sin halts communication with God. And as we look at God being our father, as we talked last night, who wants to answer the prayers of his children, he cares, he has our best interest in mind, just like any good father. I'd ask you, I'd ask you tonight, if your children have done something wrong against you, if they've committed a sin against you, and you, you got on to them and you told them that was wrong, and they never apologized and they continued in their course, would there not be something in that relationship that you didn't want there that need to be fixed? Was that dad's fault? Well, dad, you just need to look over it. Fathers, you need to look over that sin, just love them anyway. Hey, he still loves you. Dad still loves you. <laughs> but you still need to get that right. Yes, sir. You still need to fix that relationship because you call it. If there's a problem with your relationship, there's a problem with your prayers tonight, not on God's part. It's not on God's part that you're having a problem with prayer. Some people say, I feel like I'm not getting through with God. I feel like God's not listening to my prayers. You have to look internally before you look anywhere else. You have to say, there's something in my life that is keeping me from that proper relationship with God. My humble in my prayers. You know, 1 John 5, 14, we haven't looked at a lot of verses. Let, let's look at this one. 1 John 5, verse 14. And this, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Right? This is the confidence. What's the confidence tonight? What, what's the trust? What's, where's your faith? What is it in tonight? The Bible says this is the confidence. What shall we ask? Or Sorry, if we ask anything according to will he hear with us, and if we know that he hear us, what shall we ask? We know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. So many are seeking God to do something, and they never, they've never met the first condition. They've never met the first condition. They, they don't have the confidence. You should have all the confidence in the world in prayer when it meets 1 John 4, 5, 14. When you're praying that the Lord's will would be done, when it's according to his will, he heareth us. Now, biblical prayer in its most simplistic understanding, what, what is prayer? We can go very simple. It's, it's just talking to God. Sometimes, again, we, we try to make these elaborate things about prayer, but in its simplest, simplest term, it's just yeah. talking with God. Yeah. Uh, some people talk about how to pray. You know, you have to pray a certain way. You have to pray on your knees. You have to pray standing. You have to pray this and that. The Bible has all of it. People that prayed on their knees, people prayed standing. There's no way, there's no specific way to pray. It's just that you pray. <laughs> There's, there's no great there's no great thing. I think kneeling, you should do some of it because I believe it shows the first the first step of prayer, which is humility. That's why I think kneeling is good sometimes. If you don't ever kneel, there, there might be a little problem there because kneeling shows the heart of humility. I do think it's interesting that in the days gone past, the years that I grew up, that it wasn't uncommon to have altars full of people on their knees in prayer. You say, does it mean anything to be on your knees? No, but I think it shows a lot of humility. I think it shows a lot of humility. I mean, grown men today. I think it'd be hard for us to see a lot of grown men today come to an altar and get on their knees, all the people in the church watching. But if you want to get a hold of God, people say, that's okay. I'll, I'll go ahead and get on my knees in front of anybody and everybody because I just want to pray. I don't want to talk to God. I didn't care. That's, that's what humility does. But praying, you know what? Some people say, well, can you pray? In your car, can you pray? You can pray absolutely anywhere. Anywhere you could talk to anybody else, you could talk to God. Yeah. If you could talk to somebody else driving down the road, why couldn't you talk to God driving down the road? You know how much time we've wasted? People not praying in their cars. You, there's plenty of time by yourself in the car. Open your voice and talk to God. It doesn't have to necessarily be audible. You can pray in your mind to the Lord, or it can be audible. Doesn't matter. Well, the Bible says. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With mouth, confessions made into salvation. People say, when you get saved, does it have to be a verbal prayer? It doesn't have to be a verbal prayer, but it needs to be a prayer of your heart to God. Well, in your spiritual Christian life, there needs to be a prayer. It doesn't have to be verbal, but there needs to be some praying in your heart to the Lord. And there needs to be a lot of it. 
as we think on prayer, I think probably the more flowery the prayers get, the more unimpressed God probably is anyway. People think, man, that guy can pray. I, I don't know if he can pray or not. I mean, you've been in church long enough. I'm pretty sure you can put together a good prayer. I'm not I'm not picking. I'm just being honest. But somebody that wants to get a hold of God and talks to God, that, that's, what's, what's, that, that's what God is looking for. He's looking for somebody to be sincere. And that's why, again, I go back to children. Hey, if you, you're a little child and you're sincere with God, God will hear you way over that flowery prayer that everybody else was impressed by. Now, here's what I remember. I remember when I got saved as a young man. I was young in church. I remember getting saved. I remember the Lord dealing with my heart. I remember after that being so convinced of prayer. I just remember, I honestly, I don't know how to put it all into words, but I remember when I first got saved just thinking as a young man, God wants to hear my prayer. I remember the preacher preaching this message on having a prayer closet. Now, I don't know. Everybody hears things different. As a kid, I thought that was literal. <laughs> I did. I thought, man, I need to have a prayer closet. I went home, and my mom was here actually tonight, but she'll probably remember this. I cleaned my closet out, put this blanket on the floor, and that that was, what do you know? This is my prayer closet. <laughs> this is where I'm going to pray every day. I just remember being so convinced that prayer was so important. And you know what? Probably some of the best praying I ever did was then because it was in full faith trusting God. I remember it. I remember getting on my knees and praying. I remember prayer meetings in our living room. And I'm talking about simple faith. I didn't know anything. But I remember getting on down praying. And I just pray for my lost loved ones and be crying, praying to God that he'd save them. Amen. I remember that as a young man just thinking, God, God could save them. God could bring the right person by. I didn't understand what prayer was about or any of that. I just knew God had the power to answer prayers, and it meant something to me. Amen. And the truth is, the further you go along in life and the, and the more you grow, sometimes you lose the simplicity of what prayer is and how serious it is, too, of calling upon God in true faith and trusting him for the outcome. You know, it's, it's nothing more than seeking God for our daily needs. Now, someone asked the question, why do we pray when God knows it already? You ever asked that question? You ever heard that question? Hey, why do we pray if God already knows what I'm going to ask? And the simplest of answers to that is he wants to hear you. Amen. <laughs> Pretty simple, right? I mean, God, God wants to hear it from you. Here's something I'd say on that note. Before you raise your hand in a church service, ask people to pray for you. You better make sure you've prayed about it yourself first. That's simple, but no, we're, we're not careful. We're, we'll raise our hand, ask the whole church to pray for our need, and we've never once went to God for ourselves. God wants to hear from you. Yes, amen. Amen. God wants you to pour your heart out. God wants you to let him know and you to trust in him. I've heard people say this before. I know when I ask that man or that woman to pray for me that they'll do it. I think we all should want to be one of those people. No, it shouldn't be that we just know a few of those people. We should want to be that person. Yeah. Now, I don't know. Again, I'm not here to confess, but I'll be honest. In my Christian life, there are people that say, will you pray for me? And I say, I pray for you. And you know what? I never did. I completely forgot about it. I didn't take it serious enough. Now, I've tried to get that right. I've tried to make sure. If I say, I don't want to lie. If I tell somebody, you be careful. You tell somebody you're going to pray for them. You better be honest about it. You better pray for them. A lot of people that get this spiritual say, oh, yeah, I'll pray for it. all that guy's going to pray for me. They never even thought about it again. It's important that we're, we're serious with our prayer. We mean it. If we're going to pray for somebody. We pray for them. As we think on that, think about missionaries. You know, the talk about the unseen. You don't see your missionaries. You see all these missionaries in the backboard. They come in. They say the number one thing we need is prayer. No, we definitely need money. We can't get over there without any money, but we, we need prayer. And a church is supposed to not commit just financially, but they're supposed to commit more importantly. Sometimes you might not have the finances, but you're supposed right. to commit to prayer. It's the last time you prayed for a missionary. Last time you prayed for your missionaries. Now, as I ask that, do you know their names? Hard to pray for people you don't know the names of. See, we, and then we, we develop this generalization of prayer, right? Pray for our missionaries, Lord. Right. Good teaching. But I think the Lord wants us to be specific about that. Because that, that shows the heart that I care about them. Lord, would you pray? Lord, I pray tonight for the Irvins. Would you help the Irvins in Uganda? And I call them out by name. Lord. Shows that I care. I'm thinking about it. Considering them. 
Lord wants to see us rely on him to make the best judgment on our behalf. You know, one of the hardest things for children, hardest things for children of every age is to think, dad has my best interest in heart. Dad really knows what I need. <laughs> Most kids think, nah, I know what I need. I need candy for breakfast. Dad thinks I need protein and all this. I just, I need candy. <laughs> I need all these other things. But dad knows best. But that's a struggle all the way up is for children to believe dad and mom have their best interest in mind. But it's hard for us in our flesh to honestly believe that God has our best interest and that he can make the best judgment on our behalf. That we would be dependent upon the Lord. And that's simply what trust is. Depending upon God. Putting our faith in him. God gives you a will. With that will, he allows you to make a choice as to whether you're going to seek his guidance if you're going to seek his counsel and the choices and decisions you make, or if you're going to do it on your own. You know, some people ask, what, what should I pray for? What should I not pray for? I think you're supposed to pray for everything. So, I, you know, there's some wisdom. You know, you don't need to pray about buying a car. You just need to have some wisdom. I think you need to have wisdom, but I still think you pray about the car. Yeah. I still think you pray about the house. I still think you seek God for all of it. It's just talking to, talking to the Lord, saying, Lord, this is, but I like that. I just want to make sure you're on board with this. I want to make sure I'm not just following my own plan, but it's in accordance with your will. We believe we're entitled sometimes. That's why much of our modern day prayers dominate with self. Very little concern with eternal matters. Now I know when I say this, I never honestly, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm just, I'm just being honest tonight. Wednesday prayer meetings or what, before church prayer meetings, a lot of the prayer requests, are about self. A lot of prayer requests are about physical needs. How many prayer requests about spiritual needs? And let's go a little further. How many people would feel awkward if it was? You ever been in a prayer meeting and someone said, pray for me, I've really been struggling in a certain area of my life and I need prayer? I have. And you know what? I could, I could feel it. Yeah. That it was weird mm. for them and for the people around them. They know how to handle that. People can much, they can handle much better. My mom's got some heart problems. Yeah. I'll pray for her. Right. But when it's, I have a spiritual problem, people don't know how to handle that, yet that's more biblical of what prayer is. Good. It would be spiritual things. It would be eternal things. Too many prayers focus on the physical, the material needs, and they fail to give due consideration to the deeper inner need of the heart. Very little concern for the spiritual well-being, for our walk with God, for our heart growing cold on God. We pray for church growth. We'd have more people, but do we pray for church growth spiritually in the people we have? Okay, what if we pack the building out with a bunch of people that don't want the Lord? What have we done? What if we had the people here love the Lord? Yeah, That'd make a big difference. That's important. So many times overlooked. If prayer is all about our life, very little about his life in us, shows our cares on self rather than God. As we teach our children to pray, and we we think even of our own prayers, you have to reevaluate your own prayers as you're talking to your children. Well, what's prayer about? Is it just about, because James says, hey, you, you, you pray and you have not because you ask a miss to consume upon your own life. You know, a lot of kids, it, it, they, they don't know. They're just, they want to pray for everything they can have. Lord, I sure like this, and I like that, and I like that. Now, they're sincere, and I think God understands that. We need to help them out. Say, hey, we're, that's not, God's not the genie again. God's not here just to answer all your physical prayers. But even as adults, how much of our prayers are just about, Lord, today, help me and me and me yeah. and me with all these physical things and my finances. I think you should commit all that to God. What about the spiritual side? What about the things of God? What about eternity? How many people pray to be a better witness? How many people pray they'd be uh, more, they, they'd be in the Bible more? They, they'd be encouraging to the brothers and sisters in church that they'd be a godly father and a godly mother. How many, people are, how many people's prayers are full of that? So many times we hear requests for sickness, hardship of those who are unbelievers. Some may ask for the loved one that has cancer. That's appropriate. But also often we realize and recognize the greatest need is the relationship with Christ. A lot of times people say, pray for my 
my brother has cancer. The question I follow up with is, is are they saved? Uh, because your brother having cancer is not near as bad as your brother having a sin problem that he's not dealt with. That's a bigger problem. If he steps off into eternity of cancer and he knows the Lord, it got a lot better for him. If he steps off into eternity not knowing the Lord and left in that sin, he's going to hell. Very important. Definitely physical needs, certainly merit prayer. So often this modern day Christianity, this is the only thing people find needing the attention. Completely overlooking the relationship with God. And we all need to consider that. What is it that we want from prayer? What is it? How about this? What is it that we need from prayer? What is it we need from prayer? You know, so the greatest Christians I've known and the greatest Christians I've seen in the Bible went through a lot of sickness and hardship and suffering and trials. God didn't take those things away. But they love the Lord and you know what they're praying for? No, Paul's, we're, we're out of time. What Paul prayed for every time? I pray that you being rich, that you'd have the Lord would shed grace upon you and mercy and peace upon you. <laughs> I pray the Lord make you fruitful unto every good work. He's praying for their spiritual needs. I pray the Lord would use you in a great way. I pray the Lord help you. He's thanking the Lord in those prayers for what God has accomplished and what he is accomplishing. It's all focused around spiritual things. And we need to get back to that. We need to be reminded what prayer needs to be focused on. And when we understand prayer properly, we can trust God wholly. Amen.